Awesome. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Um, welcome. And thank you guys, and thank Neil and, and Alexi, of course, for organizing and having me here and inviting me here again. It's awesome to be back. Um, so as we all know, NLP can be this sort of messy affair because you have to teach a computer about the irregularities and ambiguities of the English language, right? So you have to teach it this sort of hierarchical nature of grammar, this sort of like sparse vocabulary. But at Stitch Fix, when she says she's in her third trimester, we know that she's pregnant, right? And when she says she wears scrubs, we know that she's in medicine in some way. And when she says she's taking a trip, that means we can distill that into a fix uh, for vacation clothing. So before I start, I want to talk a little bit about myself. I'm Chris Moody. Uh, that's my Twitter handle. Uh, I talk a lot, of a lot more about this stuff. I also really like stuff that isn't word dev and LDA, like Gaussian processes. I contributed the TSNE to the latest version of Scikit-Learn. Um, awesome, sorry. Uh, <laughs> All right, we'll see how well I hold this at two inches away from my face. Uh, I've also uh, sort of active in, 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 the, in the deep learning community. I'm a contributor to the Chainer framework and a bunch of other stuff that's really neat. So anyway, if any of this stuff piques your interest, I'd love to also just nerd out on this stuff, not just Word WordDevAC and LDA. Uh, and right now, uh, I'm at Data Labs at Stitch Fix, which is the most awesome job ever because I get to work on all this stuff uh, in the context of like uh, fashion. Cool. So I'm going to talk a little bit about WordDevec, I'm going to talk about LDA, and then ultimately I'm going to try to mix the best parts of WordDevec and LDA to make LDA DevEc. So why do we even care about WordDevec? There's going to be a lot of WordDevec talks today, and I'm going to try and dive into the details of this algorithm and rip it out and try to explain it as simply as possible. But this example right here, king minus man plus woman equals queen, sort of blew up open the whole NLP world. And that's because you start to think that computers actually understand what words mean, right? So it understands that the biggest difference between king and queen is the same as the difference between man and woman, namely that there's gender in there, right? And how did it learn that? It just learned that from a bunch of raw text, right? We didn't, didn't have some table in there that said, yeah, king is male and uh, queen is female, and we didn't look up attributes for that. We just learned it from a bunch of words, you know, seen in, like, in, in a big context, just reading through Wikipedia. And I think that's awesome, and that's really, really powerful, and I think that forms the basis of like, more complicated systems later on. Great. So the way we're going to work with WordDevec is we're going to set up some objective function, we're going to randomly initialize all of the parameters, and then we're just going to do gradient descent, kind of similar to like how most machine learning algorithms go. So, and I'm going to try to do this without ever mentioning neural networks once, right? So I'm a physicist by training, I don't know anything about neural networks, and I think we can actually do this without having to invoke these giant architectures. I think we can talk this much, much more simply. So let's talk about training. You want to learn this word vector w from its surrounding context. If you've worked with NLP before, maybe you're familiar with like n-grams, and maybe a transition probability between this n-gram or this other n-gram, or maybe you've worked with TF-IDF, and you're dividing a bunch of counts together, uh, or maybe you've worked with LSI, and you're thinking about these sort of co-occurrence matrices. It's not any of those things, or at least not explicitly any of those things. Uh, instead, we're going to try and learn this word vector directly from just the context around that. And we're going to update just this word vector, no intermediates, every time we see some example. And so one of our examples might be the fox jumped over the lazy dog. And what we're trying to do is learn the vector representation for the word over given the context of the other words in that sentence. So we're trying to maximize the likelihood of the given over and jumped given over and the given over and lazy given over and so on and so forth. And so this is a pretty simple assumption, right? This isn't some, this isn't some like recurrence relation. There's no state. Right? It's a bag of words model, and it's just going to take, and, and all those words could be shuffled around in their order, and it would still wouldn't affect uh, how WordDevec is being trained. So what should this little kernel, what should this fox given over actually be? So we're Tomas Mikulov, and we're trying to invent WordDevec, so it should probably depend on word vectors in some way. And we're trying to learn them. So we're going to randomly initialize them, and then we're going to try to maximize that likelihood given those, those, those word vectors. So we're going to extract pairs of context, uh, pairs of context and target word vectors from that little window. So if we have, uh, in this case, we might have the word over as our context word. And we might then say the given over, and fox given over, and jumped given over, and the given over, and lazy given over, and dog given over. So this is the innermost for loop inside of WordDevec. There's going to be a second for loop, but this is the innermost one. Right? So in our source code, I literally have like one for loop that goes over every word in our corpus. And puts that little pivot word right there, and then goes a few words back, and a few words forward, and then extracts all those pairs inside in the middle. And then in the next iteration of our second for loop, we're going to move our context word. So before, it was at over. And now it's going to be centered around the. 
And now, uh, instead of saying, you know, the given over, now we're going to say the given the, and fox given the, and jumped given the, and over given the. So this is at a high level what WordDevec is doing, right? It just has this little window that's moving across the corpus, and it's going to extract pairs of words in that window. And then it's going to try to just train on just those pairs. And those pairs are called skip grams, right? So a, a unigram is just one word. A bigram is two contiguous words or two consecutive words. But this has a skip gram because I'm kind of like skipping a bunch of words in between my pivot and my context word. And so that is sort of the high level update path of WordDevac, right? It's just two for loops. So uh, that's why I think it's like a little disingenuous to have this big giant neural network. It's like, okay, like it's a kernel and it's two for loops, right? We can understand this in a much simpler way. All right. Fine, so like, let's talk about what that kernel is. What should this, like, what should my probability of fox given jump to be? You know, what, how should I measure the loss between W and C? And it boils down to trying to measure the difference between those two things. We wanna make them as similar as possible when we see them in the same context. And we wanna make them as dissimilar as possible if we never see those two words together. Okay, so in this case, we're gonna measure the difference between those two things as just a dot product between those two things. We could have chosen Euclidean distance. If we want to get really fancy, we could have chosen things like Halanovis distance, but it doesn't really matter. Here, in this case, we're just going to use the dot product. And dot product has some pretty nice, nice familiar properties. If those two word vectors are very, very similar, like Canada and snow, then that dot product is going to have something close to one. If those things are orthogonal, that dot product is going to be close to zero. And if those things are really, really dissimilar, that dot product is going to be close to negative one, at least if these vectors are normalized. Okay, so that thing, that dot product, is gonna go from negative one to one. But what we really like to do is measure some sort of probability, right? And we can't have a negative probability. That's just, that's just ridiculous, right? So we're gonna try pass this through a sigmoid at some point in time. We're gonna take that dot product and pass it through. And what that's gonna give us is when these two word vectors are highly aligned, like Canada and snow, or like fox and cat, that's gonna be on the far right-hand side of this diagram, right? They're gonna be very similar. And that means that the output of that dot product is going to get pushed to plus one. On the other hand, if they're very, very dissimilar, like say Canada and I don't know, the color red or something like that, they're going to be very, very dissimilar down here. Right? And so that's just going to take our high vector thing, turn it into one scalar that goes from plus one to minus one, and then turn that into another scalar that just goes between zero and one. Now, intuitively, what this is really saying is, did those two words, that pair of words, come from my data set or not? Right? That's, it's just a logistic, it's a binary choice. Given this, these two vectors, I need to make a binary choice whether this came from my data set or not. Now, unfortunately, this uh, doesn't work. All right? uh, this doesn't work because I only show it exa positive examples. Right? Like, and if I only show positive examples, it's just going to label everything as a positive example. And it's never going to be wrong because I only showed it positive things. But that means that things like Canada and desert and Canada and you know, light are all going to be the same word vector. They're all going to be really similar. And obviously, that's a wrong model and it's a wrong decision. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to add some contrast. And I'm going to try to add some negative examples. And so this is the second part of like, what WordDevec is actually doing. And it adds this extra term at the end of that loss function. And it's going to say, OK, I saw that you had the example of fox and jumped, but I want you to rate that thing higher than fox and, say, another random word like career. right? I want you to distinguish and discriminate between something that occurred in my data and something I just randomly pulled out of nowhere. Right? So distinguish between fox and jumped and distinguish between fox and career. And that's what that negative sign says. And that word negative and that W negative is coming from somewhere in my vocabulary. Now in practice, we might actually pull a bunch of like extra negative samples. So we'll have fox and jumped on that far left side, but we might also have a bunch of other negative things. Like I really don't want you to, uh, really don't want you to emphasize that fox and career are similar. They're not. I don't want you to emphasize that fox and Android are similar, or fox and sunlight are similar. And so you draw all these extra negative samples, and that gets you a lot of contrast, and that forces you to discriminate between things that are similar and things that are not similar. On the other hand. And so we're going to compute this L function, and then we're going to nudge all the values of all those word vectors such that this thing is maximized, so that, such that this likelihood is maximized. And so that's all skip gram negative sampling. That's the key, uh, the, the most, uh, probably the most famous uh, word devec algorithm. There's three other, there's two other algorithms. And so we're going to take this loss function and we're going to optimize it. Okay, so. So it turns out it's actually kind of simple, but we can actually even make it even more simple. And this is a really, really cool paper by Levy and Goldberg in 2014. And it's one of the most cited NLP papers of 2014. Uh, and what this is actually showing is that it's actually extremely similar to matrix factorization. All right? uh, and it's really, really, really powerful. Uh, because all that double for loop stuff, 
turns out we can just write down one matrix and solve that one matrix instead of solving it stochastically as a, as in a sort of like streaming in an online sense. But I wanna sort of unpack what this mysterious PMI matrix actually is. Um, it's really cool because it's similar to traditional NLP. So Word of X sort of came out from left field. A lot of the NLP folks uh, uh, had, are more familiar with things like PMI, which is the point-wise mutual information. And it's this sort of information theoretic thing that's associate, that measures the association between W and C. I'm like, okay, all right, what does that actually mean? It's actually super simple. It's this, right? It's the number of times I have seen fox and jumped together. That's that top, that's the numerator, that's that C and W, divided by the total number of words I have, divided by, and the denominator now, the number of times I've seen fox by itself, and the number of times I've seen jumped by itself. Okay, so it's a bunch of counts divided by each other, and this sort of mysterious K. And I'll come back to that. But when I actually see this equation, what I actually really interpret is something like this. That top thing is just saying how popular is the combination of fox and jumped. Okay, now divide that by how popular is the word fox and how popular is the word jumped. Now some words, like the word the, are super, super popular, right? Like the is like every other word, right? But some words, like deoxyribonucleic acid, it's gonna show up like one in a million times, right? So if I see the combination of the and springs, like it's probably not because the and springs are particularly well associated, it's just because the word the shows up all of the time, right? So in this case, this ratio tells me how much am I over-indexing, basically. How much is that the word the or the word fox or the word jumped how much is that pair of words sort of above average, right? And so if that ratio is above one, then those two words have like, have a kind of, must be associated in some way. If, those, if that ratio is equal to one, it's like, yeah, those, both of those words are pretty much that common and, and I would kind of expect them to show up that like frequently. And if that ratio is below one, then you're like, oh, those words are like sort of negatively correlated. Having that word over here means that that other word must never show up. And so that's what Word Devec is doing. This is what sort of more traditional NLP is doing. But what all the, the only thing that really, the most important thing that Word Devec does differently is it adds this K, right? That is a critical, critical K. And that thing is saying, I want you to emphasize really, really popular words. That's very, very important because words are sort of uh, zip flaw distributed, right? So I have lots and lots of words that only show up a few times. The top 1,000 words, like if I restrict my whole vocabulary to just the top 1,000 words, I can probably explain like 95% of like what I'm saying right now, of like Wikipedia right there is just those top 1,000 words. But I really want to model all of like the rare words. And what this is saying is like, look, if I've only seen that word 20 times, I don't really want you to pay that much attention to it, right? It's a kind of a noisy word. But if I've seen that word millions and millions of times, yeah, amplify that word by a factor of K and make sure that you model that word extremely well. And so that's what Vortebeck is basically doing. It's just giving more weight to frequent words and less weight to infrequent words. And that's why this method is so powerful. That's why like casting it in this matrix factorization way is so powerful because you immediately start to see that, oh, Vortebeck is really just like a really sort of like naive noise model on top of my words. And that's what makes it so very powerful. So for the last few years, I've been suggesting, oh, you should use Jensen, you should use uh, the Spark uh, Word Devec libraries. Uh, but recently, in the last few weeks, I've, I've started changing all of our Word Devec stuff uh, at, at Stitch Fix over to just being count based stuff. And so I don't, this is a bunch of code, I don't actually expect you to read it. Uh, but you know, now that 99% of Word Devec is just counting, I can, you know, SQL is really good at counting stuff, right? And so here's the query that I actually use uh, at home to count how many words uh, uh, show up and in what context. So here's the critical part, right? Count how many times I saw fox and jump together. Count how many times I saw just fox. Count how many times I saw just jumped, right? And so that's the query. And then this is the whole math for word devec, right? You can take that, I initialize some matrix that's of the size of like number of words by number of words. And then I'm gonna plop in every single element. I'm gonna say how many times did fox and jump come together? Divide by the total number of words. And then what's that ratio? I'm gonna divide by how many times I, saw, I expected to see the word fox, and how many times I expected to see the word jumped. And then I'm gonna multiply by my magic constant k, which is gonna emphasize frequent words over infrequent words, and that's it, right? I save that, I take the log of that, and then I throw that into SVD. And any linear algebra library in any programming language worth its salt is gonna have SVD in it, right? And so that's it, right? So now this is awesome, because I've just gone from 
having sort of like this big like pipeline of word to vec stuff down to like fitting one matrix in five minutes on one core on one machine in like four lines of code, right? It's super simple, it's awesome, it works really, really well. Uh, and that's why that paper is so cool and so important and one of the most highlighted side of things. Okay, so I've talked a lot about like how the word to vec algorithm works and I've given you two different ways of solving it. Um, I want to talk just a tiny little bit about the results. Uh, these, on the top three rows here are different word -vec like algorithms uh, that came before word -vec. Um, and you had, and, and so that top row is, is, is sort of like a, a target query word, like Redmond. What are the words that are really similar to Redmond? And the Colibert model, that's that uh, second to the top row, is saying, oh, Conyers and Lubbock and Keene are really similar to Redmond. I don't, okay, I don't really get it. I don't know what any of those words mean, but like maybe, but Redmond is similar to Redmond Washington. Okay, it's cool. That's like a slightly different spelling and Redmond Washington again, and Microsoft. Okay, Microsoft makes sense. It's actually in Redmond. Um, what about ninjutsu? Ninjutsu is similar to ninja and martial arts and sort of, okay, awesome, that's great. That's super cool. Uh, word of vec is really working. So what's actually happening when we add all of these word vectors together, when we add king and man and, and woman? Uh, so we're gonna, so I'm gonna try to show an example of what this math means and it's gonna help us build an intuition and we're gonna leverage that intuition later on to build LDA to vec. So in this case, I'm showing just two out of like 500 dimensions. This is basically as if we'd like PCA'd it, we're gonna load up all of our word vectors. I'm gonna only show you four of them, but maybe there's 100,000 here, right? So I have king and queen and man and woman. And I'm gonna take the difference between man and woman, I'm gonna load up those word vectors, calculate that difference vector. And it's gonna be just man minus woman. I'm gonna load up the word vector for king, and then I'm gonna add head to tail uh, the word vector for man, woman. I'm gonna end up with some extra point. I don't know where it is, but I can mechanically add the elements of those vectors together, find some new point. I'll, now I'll look through all of my vocabulary to figure out what of those 900,000 words is actually closest to this thing, and I might get the word queen, all right? So it didn't have to be true, but it was. And that's really, really remarkable that queen was the, like the resulting vector. Now what's really, really cool uh, is that direction is that direction between man and woman, between king, king and queen, right? And that direction encodes gender. And it doesn't just encode gender for those four words, it encodes gender across all of my words. It encodes gender for between daughter and son, it, it encodes that gender between aunt and uncle, between man and woman, king, queen. And so you start to get the notion that like, this is actually a regular linear relationship, right? That that direction always means gender. It always means that the more I move in that top left direction, I get to be uh, more feminine. And of course, I don't have one dimension, two dimensions, I have 500 dimensions. So in fact, one of those other dimensions might mean something like higher status, like that could be the difference between man and king, right? And so this is sort of how I'm encoding, or how word vec encodes words, as these sort of regular relationships in 500 different ways. So that's really cool. So we live in this vector space where addition and subtraction are semantically meaningful. So I can take check and currency and get the corona, the check crown. That's awesome. It's definitely the check currency, right? Hanoi, in fact, the Vietnamese capital. Lufthansa, definitely a German airline, right? So this is super cool because now you get the idea that these vectors are really just mixes of other ideas and mixes of other vectors. That addition and subtraction of vectors isn't just like a nonlinear algebra thing. It's like something that conceptually means something to me. Okay, so one thing I really want to do is use that at Stitch Fix. Now Stitch Fix is this sort of personalization service. You sign up on our website, uh, you tell us a little bit about yourself, and we'll send you uh, clothing, and we'll send you fashion that we think is relevant to you in some way. And you might like some of it, and you'll buy it, and you'll keep it, and you'll return the rest in a box. And along the way, you'll give us a bunch of feedback. Uh, and you might say things like, oh, I really love the stripes and the cut around this, uh, I, I really love the stripes and the cut around my neckline is really amazing. And someone else might write that this uh, thing is like uh, gray and it's black. And so Word of Vec is starting to pick up on the subtlety and nuance in that language, right? And that really works really well because for some items, we have several times the amount written for them than we do like the collected works with Shakespeare. So we really, really understand some of these <laughs> items. So, okay, so I wanna take the word vector for this item and I wanna add the word vector for the word pregnant. All right, so we had just launched our maternity line and we might get a bunch of other items like this. And when, and, you know, I don't expect you to know these item numbers, but if I go back and look up like what they look like, they're in fact stripes, they are black and gray, except you can see that the model's wearing a maternity bump, right? So they're actually safe from maternity. They're great for expecting moms. They have similar tones and are flowy, just like the previous uh, item. So it's really awesome that I can do that kind of math on my own corpus with our own concepts, with our own ideas. 
So I talked a lot about WordDevec, but now I want to talk a little bit about LDA because it's my second favorite algorithm. Um, and LDA is very, very good at summarizing documents in ways. And so in this case, I've shown up uh, most of our inventory and shown like lots of images here. Uh, and what I've done is shown that LDA is effectively clustering these items just by using how people describe these items. And the people will call this cluster, for example, is a clunky jewelry cluster. And somewhere else, there's gonna be like a dangling, delicate jewelry cluster. Um, you know, this was one on, uh, you know, you'll, you'll, get, you'll extract topics on patterns and styles. And this cluster is similarly described because these are all sort of high contrast tops that sort of just have these popping colors to them. And that's how, and I like this a lot because this is how our clients perceive our clothing, right? This is not how we think about this. This is not some metadata that we build or some big table with lots of hierarchy and attributes. This is how our clients think about our clothes and our client's perception of our clothing is much more important. So, you know, maybe you want a bright dress for like a warm summer night, and there's definitely an LDA topic for that, right? So LDA helps us model these topics over documents in a very, very interpretable way. So I want to talk a little bit about what the differences between LDA and WordDevec are. So one of the biggest differences is that they come from very, very different communities, right? So on the machine learning side, on the WordDevec side, you get, uh, you, get, you get diagrams that kind of look like this, right? It's this big, giant neural network with a bajillion different parameters and it must work because look how much stuff is in it, right? The Bayesians, on the other hand, are a completely opposite paradigm. They're like, look how beautiful and elegant my model is. There are only four letters in the whole thing, right? <laughs> so I, I think it's a really big difference between these two communities, but effectively they're really actually doing a lot of very similar things. So WordDevec, for example, is local. It's trying to predict one word uh, given another word nearby, right? It's not trying to predict a word that's a hundred things nearby. It's trying to predict another words within like four or five things. And it treats the whole world like it was one very long text string, no end of documents, no end of sentences or anything like that. And we just have this window that's moving across those words. But if you're like me, uh, you probably have a database at home or at work, uh, and it looks a little bit like this. You have a column, and there's definitely ends to those comments. There's definitely ends to those strings. And you probably have it indexed by something, right? There's a document index. And so what LDA is doing is it's effectively using that index to predict all of the words in there. It's trying to use that structure, that document structure that you already have, to try and predict all of the words inside of it, right? And the difference between LDA and WordDevic gets very, very big for things like legal documents or medical documents when you have tens of thousands of words. Another really big difference, and I want to spend a lot of time on this, is how they're representing the word vectors. So typical word to vec vectors are going to be sort of real line distributed. I'm going to have numbers that go between minus 0.75 uh, yeah. uh, and, uh, sorry, All right, it was a mistake, clearly a mistake to try and open up water bottle and talk at the same time. Thanks. And the LDA document vectors are all going to add up to, they're all percentages, right? They're all going to add up to 100%. And I think this is actually a really, really, really big difference because it means that uh, one is a little bit more interpretable than the other, right? Uh, it's much easier for me to say to another human being that this document is 78% in one category than it is to be it's plus 2.2 .2 in this and minus 1.25 in something else. WordEvec is a little bit more like an address, right? It's like 200 Main Street. That 200 Main Street isn't 200 times one Main Street. But I can figure out a lot from its neighborhood, right? Like 200 Main Street might be in New York, and I know the demographics of New York, and I know that the word vectors around this word vector can be similar in some way. On the other hand, LDA is more of a mixture model, right? It says that it is 78% of some topic and 11% of some other topic. And so that's a critical, critical ingredient, right? And that's going to help us like interpret things. And the, the difference between these things gets exaggerated when I go between five dimensions and say a hundred dimensions, right? Now my hundred dimensional word devec vector looks like this. I can't go to my CEO and say, yeah, this is what clients are saying, right? It's like, <laughs> what, what are you giving me? It's like, oh yeah, it's plus 0.6 in the first dimension and uh, plus 0.25 in the second dimension. And right, like I can't really do that, but I can totally tell her that it's 78% in this direction. Could have been in a hundred different categories, but it's only in, in two or three, and it's mostly in this one and just a little bit in these other categories. That's really, really, really helpful for her when she's trying to run the business, when she's trying to tell us, like, what are our clients saying? Is it shipping issues? Is it this other thing? I want numbers on these things. And that's how we can actually steer the ship and we can steer our business, is through things that are human interpretable. So 
the word defect vectors can be similar in 100 different ways, right? Because they're 100 dimensional and they're very, very flexible. But the LDA vectors can be similar in far fewer ways, right? Because most of those things are going to be zero. Um, and that lets us be a little bit more interpretable. It's a lot easier for me as a human being to read two numbers instead of 100 numbers. And it's a lot easier for me to read percentages instead of like floating point numbers. And I'm going to argue that if we want to mix these two things, we're going to try to add mixtures and we're going to try to add sparsity. And that's what we're going to try to do with LDA device. So you should try to take this, take this, this is a series of experiments. So take it with a grain of salt. Um, I did them over Christmas. I just recently submitted a paper on it. But, you know, this is not, this is not like uh, super production grade work, right? It's, uh, but it's, it's more like prototyping and playful and fun things. So where Wordevac is predicting things locally, right? So if I have a sentence like Lufthansa is a German airline, I'm going to take the word German and I'm going to try to predict the other, word, the other words around it. I'm extracting those pairs of pivot and target words in a moving window that scans across my corpus. Now, what we really need, though, to make it more like LDA is we're going to need to add a document vector. And this is going to be really helpful. So if we have the word German, uh, we might predict other words that are similar to German, like French or Spanish, right? But this document might be about airlines, so we're not talking about other languages. And if we add, if we know before that we can add word vectors together, right? And if we know that we can add the word German and we can add the word airline, we're going to get the word Lufthansa. And now my predictions are going to be a lot more accurate because I'm combining some sort of local context of the word German and sort of this global context that this document is about airlines in general. Then I'll be able to guess much more accurately that the other words around there are going to be closer to Lufthansa. They're closer to Aero Lloyd and these other sort of uh, German airlines. Right, so we're going to have this latent document vector, and it's going to be randomly initialized for every document in a corpus. And if we do this, we're going to get a very, very similar layout to sort of doc to vec and to paragraph vectors. And it's really, really useful. It works really well. Uh, it's good for training sentiment models. It has really great sort of perplexity scores, um, but it's not interpretable, right? If I look at that word vector, it's going to look, or if I look at that document vector, it's going to look like all of my other word vectors. Um, and, you know, this thing is you know, about as interpretable as a hash, right? It's not that helpful. All right, so let's make this into a mixture and let's make this into a, uh, uh, and then let's add some sparsity. So this is how you make this into a mixture. You're gonna keep adding like a few more like layers to this. You're gonna add a few more steps to this, right? And so now we're gonna say, hey, let, let, let's say we had three topics and I'm gonna have a document weight and your, in that document weight is gonna be a composition of a bunch of topics and then weights on those topics. So in this case, it might be that my document is 0.34 in topic zero and minus 0.1 in topic two. That's the second column in that topic matrix. And then the 0.17 in topic three. That's the third column in that topic matrix on the far right side. So before we had you know, 100 degrees of freedom for each document, but now we only have three degrees of freedom. Right? The word vector space is still 100 dimensional, but we only have, we have far few, we have, it's far more constrained. Right? And so the model better choose really good topics because I only have a few ways uh, to summarize the whole document. And so I want to talk a little bit about what those topic vectors are actually doing. So if I rip out that first column of that topic matrix, that's going to be my topic zero. And I'm going to compare it to a bunch of my other word vectors. Right? And, and I'm going to figure out which ones are the most similar to this topic vector. And I might get for topic zero that uh, the most similar words are Trinitarian or baptismal, Pentecostals, schismatics and excommunication. Oh, okay, all right, I get it. So like this must be the sort of like the, this must be like the religion topic or maybe the Christianity topic or something like that. Uh, okay, so let's, let's, let's move over from column one to column two. So I moved over once in that matrix. And now, now my most similar words are Milosevic or absentee, Indonesia, Lebanese, Israel. Okay, this must be like, a, I don't know, the, like a, the politics like topic or something like that, right? And so that's how these topic matrices are working. And so when I said earlier that this, that this document weight is plus 0.34, it must be plus 0.34 times religion and minus 0.1 times politics. That's still kind of uninterpretable. Like, what does it mean to be plus 0.34 in religion? And what does it mean to be minus 0.1 politics? Like, mathematically, that works out. But is that intuitive? I don't know. I don't know what it means to be negative politics. I have no idea. And on top of that, that word vector is really dense. It kind of looks like that, right? So what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to make it, uh, we're, we're going to try to softmax this thing. And so that softmax is going to move everything from negative infinity to infinity to proportions. Now we're actually back into percentages land. We're getting a little bit closer to LDA-like uh, representations. And so now, instead of being 0.34 of religion, 
we're now 41% of religion, and now we're, instead of being negative 0.1 of politics, we're 26% of politics. Okay, so at least that I can kind of interpret. But now the problem is that like, first time I did this, I still got, it was very dense, right? And so I would get that this one document vector is you know 2% in this direction, 3% in this other one, it's 8% of this, 7% of that, 5% for 100 times, right? And you're like, okay, there's a zillion categories, and it's really hard for me to interpret what this document is when it's spread out in so many different ways. So that's why it helps to you know, make it sparse. So that's the, the, like the third and final ingredient of LDA to VEC is to, is, is to add sparsity. So it starts off kind of like this. This one document is spread out in a bunch of different places, but at the end of the day, we're gonna add this little like loss function, and we're gonna, make it, uh, we're gonna make it be very, very sparse at the end of the day, so that we ultimately only choose that every document can you know, be in as few categories as possible. And it turns out that that likelihood function, it's kind of written down the top, on the bottom right, is actually super, super simple to calculate, and I think it's actually so simple that if anyone's designing their own machine learning algorithms, it's pretty simple to just toss it in and you get a lot of interpretability out of it, right? You can take a really powerful algorithm and make it interpretable, and that's something that's kind of lacking a lot of the time in the machine learning, or especially the deep learning community. Like, most of the deep learning results are not something that will help me understand the science and themes and topics of my business, right? They will help me give really good predictions, but they're not really gonna help me understand like what happened in December. Like, why did the revenue go up, or why did the revenue go down? But interpretable topics might, right? Or at least they'll give me like some insight into it. And so the idea here is that we'll start off and there'll be, and you can see the, the sort of the, the pink or the red uh, document proportion vectors, they'll start off very, very homogenous. But what this loss function is gonna do is it's gonna encourage sparsity. And by the end, it's gonna be 99% in one category and 1% in something else and then 0% like in everything else. And that's why sparsity and interpretability and mixture models are so powerful. Okay, so at the end of the day, you're gonna end up with something that's quite a bit more complicated than just word to vec by itself, but it's gonna achieve our goals, right? It's gonna mix word vectors and with these sort of sparse and interpretable document uh, representations. So now I can use some, here's, here's, here's the fun part of the, the talk. I can start to give you like uh, results on sort of uh, Hacker News uh, comments. So I downloaded the Hacker News corpus. It's like one or two gigabytes of just comments and text. And you can find these kinds of really, really fun relationships, right? So you get that, you know, um, you get very word to vec like relationship. The California plus technology, you get Silicon Valley. Digital plus currency, you get Bitcoin. Okay, it's definitely a digital currency. I think it's really cool that JavaScript minus browser plus server, you get Node.js, which is, you know, uh, server side Node.js. I mean, it's still JavaScript, but it's, it's, you know, it's on the server. Um, Mark Zuckerberg and Jeff Bezos, both the CEOs of Facebook and Amazon. That's pretty cool. Um, NLP minus text, I had to do an NLP example. NLP minus text plus image is computer vision. Um, Snowden and Assange, both whistleblowers, one of them in the US, one of them mostly in Sweden. Um, so it's pretty cool, right? Like, uh, it's pretty cool that it picks that stuff up. But, you know, if you had just done WordDevec by itself, you would have gotten a lot of those results. So I wanna, I wanna talk a little bit more about like the sort of like uh, the different topics. Let's see if I, do I have enough time? Yeah, I have enough time. So all, all of this code is up on GitHub. It's all, uh, and you can look, actually look a lot of these notebooks as well and play through them. And this one's pretty fun. Like this is the, this is the LDA of like model run on, uh, on the Hacker News comments. So like we start to look at some of this and it's, I'm using this really awesome library called PyLDA Viz, which allows you to sort of interact uh, very quickly with a lot of the topics and uh, the, a lot of the most uh, popular words in each topic. So what's going on, the, on the, on the left-hand side here are I have 40 different topics, and I wanna try and figure out what those topics were. Earlier, we were saying, oh, this must be the religion topic because it's got schismatics and uh, Trinitarians and Pentecostals in it. Well, this is kinda how you figure out what the label of that topic should be. You start to look at the most popular words. Oh, this is housing costs, um, rent, uh, okay. Uh, oh, housing, affordable housing, housing prices, gentrifying. Okay, this must be, this must be something about like, you know, housing prices and rent prices have sort of skyrocketed lately. Must be something about that, right? Um, let's look at another topic. Uh, let's look at topic eight. Uh, Bitcoins, uh, Mt. Gox, denominated, capital gains, tax liability, liquidity, index funds, 
uh, deflation, dwell it. Okay, this must be sort of like a finance and like money topic, right? Okay, Hacker News loves to talk about Bitcoin and probably talks about you know other sort of stock market type stuff. Uh, let's look at another one. Um, uh, topic 16. So neutrinos, tau, quantum mechanics, computer simulation, black holes, space time, pi, Kalmara, space. All right. So this must be. This is a little closer to my heart. This is must be like a physics and 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 science topic, right? Uh, that's cool. Uh, okay. Uh, all right, here we go. Here's, here's maybe a little more interesting one. Scala, JS, Julia, Rust, generics, go routines, optional typing, right? So th this must be like, these must be documents that are about programming or programming languages or computer theory or whatever, right? So this is, so this is why LDA is so useful, right? Like, because we can actually t go back and we can start to like extract uh, patterns out of these topics and we can start to understand like the themes in all of our, in all of our data. So, and that's, that's exactly what I do later on in this notebook. Um, let's go look at uh, some cool examples. Um, oh, here's a good one. So, uh, I plotted two topics and I can show, I know when the comment was made. I know if it was made in 2008 or if it was made in 2013. Um, and so this is showing that like, this green line is housing, social issues, affordability, and rent. And you can see right around 2013, people started really talking a lot about like, rent and a lot about how unaffordable the San Francisco and Bay Area is starting to become. So that's really cool, right? So like, if I'm running Hacker News like, as a business, like, I really want to know what people are talking about. I really want to know what the overall like, arching trends are. I really want to know what's focusing and what's dominating that community. And in this case, it might be housing and rent, right? And so if I were really thinking about that, like a client base, like maybe I would try to engage with that community a little bit more or maybe I would offer like more housing specific like options to Hacker News, right? So that, that gives us a way to quantify and understand in a very interpretable way uh, what's going on in the text of like the Hacker News community. Uh, let's see, there's a few other ones here. Uh, oh, here's a cool one. All right, so I plotted uh, six or seven different topics, all sort of about social issues. Like civil rights is one of them, technology in, the, in society. Uh, there's one about privacy, FBI wiretapping. Uh, this, this, this spike right here has to do with terrorism, surveillance, and constitution stuff. Um, and it spiked in the middle of 2013. Now, does anyone know what happened in the middle of 2013 that would throw such a wrench into the Hacker News like community? Snowden. Yeah, exactly. Nailed it. Yeah, Snowden. Uh, Snowden released a bunch of. Uh, released a bunch of documents at that time. And so as a result, uh, you can see there's an incredible surge of interest and a huge amount of like, um, a huge surge of just topics about that, right? So again, if I'm running Hacker News like a business and I suddenly see a bunch of topics pop up, like this allows me to understand it. And, and it's not clear to me how you would use WordDevec alone to do things like that, right? Um, but LDA and LDA DevEc by extension will give you things like that. You'll be able to understand a lot of like the comments in your text and a lot of your business. Cool. Let me go back. So there's a little bit of documentation on LDA DevEc on the web. It's mostly just sort of API and reference documentation. Um, it's, it doesn't have a great number of like narrative documents, documents, but it's mostly because it's still sort of a fun prototype toy project. Um, but there are a lot of examples. Uh, it runs on the GPU pretty effectively. It's got a lot of unit testing, although a lot of them are failing right now, so take that with a grain of salt. And so here's a question that a lot of people ask me about LDA DeVec, and it's like, should I actually use it? And most of the time my answer is no, right? Like, for the most part, like LDA, LDA runs, certainly runs like most of the business at Stitch Fix, and WordDevec runs like uh, the other big fraction of it, right? And that's because both of those are extremely powerful algorithms. Both of them have very, very robust uh, implementations in Spark and Python and R and whatever. Um, but you know, if, if you do want to sort of tweak around with your own topic models, if you want to add a topic over different parts of the region, maybe you think people in Vermont speak slightly differently than Texas. They certainly order different clothes, right? Or maybe you want to add, uh, maybe you want topics over every single client. There's something that like everyone's very, every business is always very interested in is understanding their clients. Like how, what are some clients saying? Are there stereotypes for each one of my clients? Are there archetypes rather? Like can I understand them sort of in more crude, broad strokes? Okay, maybe I should add a sort of like document vector for each one of my clients, right? And so if you want to start tweaking topic models, I would start saying, hey, maybe use LDA to vec. It's kind of cool. It'll be very quick to like try and prototype new models. 
But otherwise, these other technologies are great. And they're the technologies that are going to be the backbone. They're going to be driving 99% of like your analysis. Cool. All right. So uh, with that, uh, you guys have been an awesome audience. Uh, again, I'm Chris Moody. That's my Twitter handle, uh, where I talk a lot more about this stuff. I'll be posting a blog post about this pretty soon on the multi-threaded Stitch Fix blog series. Um, anyway, awesome. You guys are great. Thanks. Do we still have time for questions, or am I out? We have a long break. We have a time for questions. Cool. All right. You guys are free to leave before I ask a question. It's been a long time to run. I'm going to say a GPU. Yes to both of those. Yeah. So the question was, uh, does LDA to VEC the question was, does LDA to VEC take a long time to run? Is yes. Um, and does it, and I would basically only run it with a GPU, right? Another reason why I wouldn't actually use LDA to VEC anywhere close to like production without like really, really vetting it, without like knowing what you're, what you're getting yourself into, right? I mean, it could, it could be useful, it could be cool, like once you build like your model that's like specific to like your domain, really addresses like your problems very, very well, but I would not try it before first trying LDA over to VEC because those things are highly optimized beasts by now, right? And there's a like really good infrastructure behind it. But yes, it does take a training, tra for example, training the Hacker News model took like two days on a Titan GPU, right? It's not, it's not commodity hardware. And it takes a while, I would not. Like, but if you like playing around with stuff, yeah, sure, play around with it. Yeah. Um, so can you say a little bit more about how the loss function for kind of increasing sparseness for the document vectors uh, compares to like the hyperparameter tuning in LDA? Like in practice, you end up getting the same sorts of results? Uh, without that sparsity parameter, no, you do not get the same results. Okay. <clears throat> um, and in fact, uh, one of the ways that you measure uh, things like word devec or word models in general is by measuring things like perplexity. Right? And so perplexity is basically uh, how well did I predict the word given that the word over or the word fox is nearby. If you don't include that sparsity parameter, you'll still do pretty well on perplexity tests. You'll still do, you'll be able to take those document vectors and you'll be able to train sentiment models on them. <clears throat> but they won't be interpretable, right? And so. And that's, that's basically because you're moving from this kind of representation down to this representation. Now, the, I think the other part of your question was how sensitive is to like hyperparameters inside of that sparsity function? Well, yeah, so like with LDA, you know that depending on the documents in your corpus, like if you're looking at a bunch of things that are like survey articles, then like your actual corpus is going to have documents that have right. whatever, you know, four or five different topics that are salient in them. Um, and so you can kind of twiddle this, you know, hyperparameter to sort of either increase or decrease the sparsity. And, and so does this sort of work in the same way? Because it's sort of a different product. Yeah, so this is literally the Dirichlet likelihood of seeing those proportions. So it's actually going to be very, very similar to the hyperparameters in LDA. So there's that alpha in there. That's the concentration parameter that goes inside of like a normal LDA model. If that alpha is above 1, you in, fact, uh, you in fact don't encourage things like this, you encourage things like this. If that alpha is far below one, usually people set it to one over the number of topics, then you encourage like lots of sparsity. But yeah, the number of topics is important, the, number, the, the concentration is important. Um, in practice, you, you, you just run a bunch of different things and you figure out like kind of quality. It's an unsupervised model, so unless you happen to have like supervised data to check it on. And if you do have supervised data, then don't bother using LDA, just train a normal thing, classifier on it. <laughs> yeah. I'll say it loud. Uh, so that reminds me of Sherpa. Sherpa was the only one I asked for that years ago. <laughs> I could see something beyond Stitch Fix for preferences. Might we see something beyond Stitch Fix for preferences? Uh, no, Stitch Fix is the ultimate answer. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think like ultimately like preferences and things like that are inevitably very, very long tail. It's, 
a lot of the conversation we have at Stitch Fix is how do we address personalization? How do we understand it better? And to me, the way I answer this question is text and how people talk to each other is extremely efficient at like communicating those personalization preferences. Right? It's, it's not like a dialogue box where you punch in like a bunch of preset options. It's very natural, it's very fluid, but it takes a huge amount of effort to get even like the most crude representations for what you're saying, like this. So ultimately, you know, maybe Stitch Fix is like the right answer for personalization, but more importantly, I think like text and text representations are actually like the most powerful way to understand personalization, to understand your personal style, to understand um, very, very long tail events. Um, so, yeah, like, um, words of vector zone seem really awesome, um, and it makes the, the outputs are very interpretable. Um, but also, like, all kind of distributional models, there are some also, some kind of, like, insidious things that sometimes does. So, like, one thing, as an example, is you gave an example where you're trying to find similar words or synonyms, and sometimes it can actually lead to, like, antonyms being similar. So, like, I ate a tasty pizza, I ate a disgusting pizza, like those two words are actually used in a very similar way. Um, yep. So like, how do, you, how do you deal with things like this? Um, especially like in production, when you rebuild a new model of your pipeline, does that just get deployed to production automatically? Or do you have like someone manually validate it? What, what kind of things do you do there? Yeah, it's a really good question. So the question is that things like, like Word Devec, they, they don't necessarily differentiate between things like sentiment they don't capture the valence of a lot of words. And your example, I think, was like, this pizza is really tasty, or this pizza is really disgusting. It will actually put tasty and disgusting really close in the vector space, because they have very, very similar contexts. They appear in very similar context, in food contexts. Um, I don't have a really great way of saying how to separate those things, aside from like, give it some examples, and then train another model on top of that. Um, right? So like, for us, we know whether an item was bought or not bought. So we can kind of like hack it together and say, oh, maybe the words in that comment are all negative because it wasn't bought. Right? It's still kind of crude. Um, another thing that we actually do is, and I didn't really go talk about it today, is that we do a lot of dependency parsing. So this is actually building like a full grammatical tree, saying this noun is being modified by this adjective and this verb, and this is like the dependency tree over here, and that word actually relates to this word over here. And in those kinds of cases, you can actually get negations, and you can capture like whether something was being negated or whether something or what adjective was modifying what word. Whereas right now, word of echo is kind of just a jumbled up bag of words. In those cases, like, you can start to add a little more subtlety and a little bit more nuance of like the sort that you're talking about. Now what's interesting is that in LDA also kind of suffers like similar problems. We will get, uh, one, of our, one of our topics is, um, it's, it's interesting, one of our topics uh, is, you know, the stylist really paid attention to me really well, or the stylist like didn't, <laughs> right? And so, it's, uh, and so it's either about, uh, you know, it's definitely about attention and about whether we're listening or not, uh, but it doesn't differentiate between good and bad, right? Uh, and in that case, like, I, I don't have a great answer. Like, we just end up having to go back and saying, like, well, was it bot or was it not bot? And that's basically our label in this case. And then we can split those topics by, like, yes, like, it, she, she, she's clearly about being interested or being, or, you know, she's clearly reading, like, the client's notes and everything else. Uh, but we need to differentiate between good and bad basically just by whether it was bot or not bot. So most of, the most of the time, the answers are, it's a long-winded answer, but most of the time, my answers are like, you have external data in some way.